This is talk number four out of a series of six about the American War of Independence. I left you at the end of talk number three with the account of the notorious Stamp Act and the enormous opposition that it generated in all 13 American colonies. So the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Grenville, felt, and the King agreed with him, felt that he had no option but to repeal the Stamp Act and think of something else as a means of raising money. So the Stamp Act was duly repealed. But Grenville also wanted to make a point. It was one thing to say that he was withdrawing such and such a law, but he did not want to be backed into a corner in which, he, in which the obvious implication was that he wasn't going to pass any other laws. Governments were there to pass laws. That's what they were for. And he followed up the repeal of the Stamp Act with something called the Declaratory Act, which simply said that the English Parliament has the right to tax all its subjects, and all its subjects included the American colonies. Uh, curiously, it didn't attract a great deal of attention. You might expect after the howl of dismay and rage about the Stamp Act that, that there'd be another howl of rage and dismay at the Declaratory Act. But apparently not. Uh, the colonists were so busy celebrating their victory over the repeal of the Stamp Act, they didn't take a great deal of notice of the Declaratory Act. But of course, Grenville still had to make his point. And a year later, in 1767, he went back to his old tried and true method of customs duties. His chancellor, Lord Townsend, Charles Townsend, imposed uh, new customs duties on five new commodities, glass, lead, paper, paint, and tea. This was what the government uh, pointed out was an external tax. This was to do with trade in between the countries. The Americans didn't want an internal tax, all right? They had said they were quite happy to pay an external tax. So Granville said, all right, well, we'll give you an internal tax, pay these. Well, of course they grumbled and they did more than grumble. They Perhaps they felt they'd been caught out a little bit because Grenville had taken them at their word. Well, they couldn't disagree, they couldn't refuse because they'd said themselves that they were willing to pay an external tax, but they huffed and puffed. Uh, they, they said that they wouldn't, wouldn't buy any English tea. There was no question of paying tax. If you don't buy it, then you don't have to pay the tax. They said they wouldn't bother about paying the tax on paper. They just make their own paper. So they wouldn't need any of the rotten old English paper. Uh, they wouldn't need English paint, rotten old English paint, because they would refuse to paint their houses. The, bare, the boards would remain bare and so on and so on. To a certain extent, perhaps, it, it looked like huffing and puffing, but it made everybody feel very much better. Into the picture comes a Boston politician called Sam Adams. Uh, his, contra his, um, his reputation appears to be somewhat controversial. At any rate, he's credited with being the man who, if he didn't think of the idea, certainly developed it of doing something to mobilize all this grumbling. I said that other people have sought to mobilize the grumbling to produce this opposition to an internal tax. They have produced no taxation without representation. Sam Adams, it would appear, took this a stage further. He decided that if you're gonna make progress, you had to mean it, you had to be busy, you had to work it, work at it, you had to make a great deal of noise, you had to make a great drama out of it all. It was no good being uh, putting forward a very carefully reasoned, moderate, uh, well put together argument. No, you simplified things. You boiled it right down. And there was no question anymore of asking nicely. You demanded what you wanted, you oversimplified it, and you hammered away with it. Uh, everything was to be simplified. It was going to be made clear who were the goodies and who were the baddies. There was absolutely going to be no doubt about it at all. And all uh, events which appeared to be controversial were to be treated in such a way as to imply that there was only going to be one possible interpretation. What the 21st century 
came to call spin. Sam Adams, it would appear, was one of the, the, the very first spin merchants. But whatever he was up to, whatever he tried to achieve, from 1767 right up to 1770, still didn't lead to war. I said, a lot of mo moaning and grumbling, a lot of huffing and puffing, a lot of sloganising, but no war. Got to 1770, and we're still in Boston. Uh, Englishmen are not so familiar with New England weather, but Americans, of course, are. The winter could be quite hard. It was a bad winter, even by Boston standards. And there was an incident outside the customs house. Would be the customs house, wouldn't it? There was a soldier on duty, a red coat, doing his job, as he did, or one of his colleagues did, every day. Apparently, a small crowd gathered. There was a bit of name calling, a bit of jostling, perhaps a bit of pushing and shoving. Nobody has produced a definitive account of all this, which is accepted by everybody. Anyway, it seems that a soldier slipped on the ice. His gun went off. Uh, the crowd around them, the word spread instantly, of course, that the British soldiers were firing at them. So some of them charged the soldiers. The, the lone sentry called his mates out and they were charged. Of course, they, they panicked and they shot. They fired their muskets. And within a very short time, uh, there were some dead bodies on the ground outside the Boston Customs House. Uh, one book I looked at said three, another book I looked at said four. I don't know what the final figure is, if indeed it has actually been universally accepted. Um, but Sam Adams had got the incident that he wanted. He pounced on this and within days, possibly as far as I know, even within hours, uh, the word was spreading all around Boston and later on all around the colonies about the Boston Massacre. Uh, the governor of Boston very prudently withdrew the soldiers to, to lower the tension a bit and Surprisingly, the officer in charge of the of the sentries, Captain Preston, who had been put on a charge, who had been tried with the charge of, of murder, was defended by an American lawyer, a relative of Sam Adams, funnily enough, John Adams, later a president. Adams defended these soldiers and they were acquitted by an American jury. Whatever the rights and wrongs of all this, however much steam was generated, once again, it did not lead to a war. It's interesting, so many of these incidents which have worked their way immovably into children's textbooks as the great dramatic episodes, none of them led to a war. There was no more war, no war at all for three more years, right up to 1773 things went very quiet again. Well, this didn't suit Sam Adams. Uh, whether he worked actively to try and stir things up a bit or whether he simply waited for something to happen and then used it to stir things up a bit, I don't know. My, my impression is that his career has produced a lot of controversy and some historians credit him with a great deal more than other historians do. So I don't know. But in 1773, something happened which appeared to give Sam Adams another chance. You may have heard of the East India Company. It was set up in the reign of the first Queen Elizabeth in 1600, as the name suggests, <coughs> to deal with trade between England and India and the Indies. Anything east, east of Madagascar practically, practically was, was to be the Indies, and it was the East India Company. And one of the commodities that the East India Company handled was tea. They were having uh, uh, some financial trouble, and they asked the English government if instead of paying all the middlemen in England when they brought their tea over, they asked if they could take it straight to America and sell it direct there, which would improve their finances, apparently. Uh, and so in 1773, this Tea Act was passed by Parliament. Um, the American merchants were cross because it 
interrupted their trade in tea. Uh, even though it made trade, it made tea cheaper, it interfered with their own trade. And they didn't want to have to pay for English tea on principle, uh, even though it was cheaper than the tea they were getting from Holland. So again, it, principle got in the way of common sense, I fancy. At any rate, <clears throat> the middlemen merchants of New England were cross with the English Tea Act. And here it appears that Sam Adams did take an active part. Uh, at the end of 1773, this is probably the most notorious incident of all, a group of his, his um, patriots, I think they call them, so a group of his supporters, some of whom were dressed up as Mohawk Indians, I've never worked out why, boarded the English ships carrying the tea. They were in Boston Harbor. Uh, they proceeded to overcome the, the remaining crew on board ship, went down into the holds, brought up the tea chests and tipped the contents into Boston Harbor, the famous Boston Tea Party. When the government heard about it, of course, they were furious. They came down like a ton of bricks, which was exactly what Sam Adams expected them to do. Why? Because it was an attack on property. Now, it was one thing in Boston in 1770 to, to manhandle one or two soldiers and push them around and make them fall over. But to attack, steal and destroy a citizen's property was a very serious thing indeed. It was the most serious thing in the almost in the entire legal system, short of murder. Uh, in the 18th century, there was something like 200 crimes not which did automatically carry the death penalty, but which could carry the death penalty because they were offences against property. So Adams knew perfectly well that when this tea was chucked into the harbour, the English government would react as if they were stung and they would come down, as I said, like a ton of bricks and they duly did. Uh, the port of Boston was closed. Now, if you're a seaport and you depend on trade, if your government closes your seaport, uh, there's nothing else you can do. You're, you're absolutely helpless. And you can imagine the, um, the rage and the frustration, everything. And what was even more, no, I won't say it wasn't the most important thing, the most offensive thing was the attack on property. The second most offensive thing was the appearance of British redcoats on the streets of Boston again. The, the physical proof of, of um, George's government, the tyrant George's government, there were these wretched redcoats uh, making a nuisance of themselves. And Adams took great care to spread the news of all this with the appropriate spin to all 13 colonies. Ah, well, you would think this is, this is what turns the tide. Did it lead to war? No, it didn't. Uh, so we had 1767 custom duties, everybody crossed, didn't lead to war. 1770, Boston Massacre, everybody furious, didn't lead to war. 1773, Boston Tea Party, didn't lead to war. Um, 1774, along came something else. In fact, two things. You said, poor old English Prime Minister, they... they You've got to hand it to them. They did try. Another problem that they inherited from the Seven Years War, the first one was, as I said, doubling the size of the empire. Another problem they inherited was the fact that they had millions of new subjects. When the French were forced to hand over all their colonial territory in America to England, and we had some ex-Spanish territory as well, we inherited new subjects. After all, just because the French had handed over their territory, didn't you say that all Frenchmen left and all Spaniards left? No, a lot of them stayed. These men had to be governed and their families. And they were Catholics. What was the government going to do about it? They didn't want they didn't want another rebellion. They had enough trouble now with the American colonists. They didn't want any more rebellion amongst the colonists in Canada or the Frenchmen left behind in North America, behind the colonists. 
1774, they passed something called the Quebec Act, which gave religious toleration to Roman Catholics. Nowadays, in the 21st century, it would hardly raise an eyebrow. Well, it raised a lot of eyebrows, all right, in the colonies in 1774. Why? Because Catholics were uniquely unpopular. This tapped in to a very, very deep chord of memory amongst the English and amongst colonists, because after all, they were the descendants of Englishmen. And deep in the folk memory of the English were the Catholic burnings by Mary Tudor in the 1550s, when over 300 people went to the flames. And in the whole of Elizabeth's reign, the entire country was subject to the threat of an invasion by Catholic Philip of Spain. So as far as most good Protestants were concerned, there was no such thing as a trustworthy Catholic. And to give them civil rights, as far as they were concerned, was simply begging for trouble. So this act to give religious toleration to Roman Catholics annoyed the colonists, to put it very mildly. There was another act too, what the government had got out of the Seven Years' War was not only a lot of new subjects, but a lot of new land. And a lot of that land was inhabited by millions of Indians who were automatically English subjects. And the government has said, bless them, they did try. What could they do for their subjects from the Indian tribes? And the Act of Parliament also passed in 1774 allowed the Indians to settle in land from the colonies behind the Allegheny or the Appalachian Mountains. Now, if, if the toleration of Catholics made them cross, giving Indians access to land behind the Alleghenies made them absolutely furious because so many uh, Americans were looking forward either to going into that land and farming it and taking it over, or going into it, buying it up cheap and selling it off for a vast profit when other pioneers moved in. So the Quebec Act, giving tolerance to Roman Catholics, made them mad, and the other act, giving Indians access to land behind the Alleghenies, uh, made them furious beyond words. They were going to be boxed in again. They could, the, the population was going up, it was only a matter of time before more and more colonists surged westward. Go west, young man. And now it's being denied. They were going to be boxed in by the damned Indians and they're going to be boxed in by the damned French. It united them again in a howl of rage and dismay. But once again, did it lead to war? No, it didn't. All these events still didn't have a war. Then the following year, 1775, um, the, the governor of Boston, General Gage, uh, heard a rumor that there were arms being hidden in a nearby town called Concord. And he decided as, as a soldier, he was not only the political governor, he was the military commander as well. He decided for the sake of security, he must find where all these arms caches were and confiscate them and bring them back to Boston and make the country safe. So he sent a column of troops out on a march to look for them. Uh, this is the, uh, the occasion of yet another, probably the most famous incident of Paul Revere and his ride around the country to warn everybody that General Gage's troops were coming. And he was gonna run, gallop all the way to Concord to warn them. Uh, I believe he didn't in fact get there, the English arrested him. But nevertheless, the, the ride became a legend. On the 19th of April, this column, on its way to Concord, came to a small town called Lexington. And thanks to Revere's warning, or somebody else's warning, they found some American troops drawn up on the green at Lexington. As with the Boston Massacre, <clears throat> nobody is absolutely sure what happened, but somebody fired. So both sides fired, and at the end of it, there were some dead bodies amongst the American local militia. So once again, we had another massacre. 
The troops moved on to Concord. There was another engagement. There was another massacre, another atrocity. Uh, they found their weapons, I think, and they decided that the only thing to do now was to go back to Boston. They had achieved the object of their trip. On the way back to Boston, every single American available was attracted like flies to honey and proceeded to snipe at them all the way. And they lost two or three hundred casualties on the way back to Boston. That wasn't the end of it either. General Gage, uh, it's another irony. You see, Gage apparently was an amiable fellow, not unpopular, and he's married to an American wife. So that, you know, it could have been sorted out possibly. We don't know. Anyway, Gage, being a soldier, looked at a hill outside Boston and reckoned that if the American rebels, as they were slowly becoming, if the American colonists, not call, let's call them colonists, if the colonists got a gun or two up on Bunker Hill, they could command the city of Boston and drop cannonballs onto Boston to their heart's content. So Gage decided <coughs> that Boston, a Bunker Hill, must be captured. And he set out to do so with 2,000 men. By that time, <coughs> the, the countryside, as you can imagine, was, was alight with revolt by now. And Bunker Hill was defended, and it was attacked, and the English captured it. But it cost them very nearly half their whole number in casualties. So there was no question now. The Boston Massacre may not have produced the war. Uh, the East Boston um, Tea Party may not have produced the war. The Civil Rights for Catholics and the Open Range for India didn't produce the war. But after Bunker Hill, my goodness me, there was going to be a war on now, all right. Bye-bye.